the sixth month for the sabbatical year 6223 from creation and there's only two more sabbaths till trumpets mm. equivalent to july 22nd 2023 today as we look on our almanac we are right here on the 18th and as you can see there's a scripture there if you want to read it in the maccabees how uh, that um, the Israelites at that time, they gave enough respect to Simon and his family were fighting wars and they wrote on some brass tablets to, to commemorate that time. And as you can see as well, the 25th is the last Sabbath of the month, month next week. And after that, the seventh day Sabbath is the beginning of the Feast of Trumpets, the beginning of the season of autumn as well. Wow. Time is moving. Looking on our mm -hmm. almanac, reminding ourselves how the spring equinox, the midsummer solstice, the mid autumn equinox, along with the winter solstice, are all the midpoints of Jah's true seasons. They are not the beginning of the seasons. Those are the beginning of the false astronomical seasons. And this calendar you see today, right there on your screen, it is the sabbatical year of 53 weeks. It's normally 364 days or 52 weeks but every seventh year is an extra week. And you can see right there added to the 12 month mm -hmm. Adar. Yes, that's right. And as always, we know that there's many people in the world who have various understandings of the Most High's name. So don't really have too much controversy with us because we use the name Jah or Jehoshua. I know people figured that the J sound was never in the ancient Hebrew. And I know they say that about the Roman and, and the Latin, but nonetheless, from our research, We've seen that Jah is a very clean name, but we also recognize the names Yah, Yahaya, Yahawa. And you can see many things on your, scre your screen right now. All these names we've studied and researched ourselves. So just be sure if you want to know the father's name and the son's name, that you ensure that you keep the commandments of love. And indeed, then you'll be showing whose name you really know. That's right. So this lesson is about the scriptural feast and holy days. And some questions we get from believers is, are they for the new covenant believers today? Now, many people say, hey, just a moment. Are not these feasts all a part of the old covenant and done away with? And as such, haven't they been fulfilled by the Savior and nailed to the cross? Aren't they therefore obsolete and no longer necessary for believers to observe? And besides, aren't they only for the ancient Jews or ancient Israelites? Now, I'm pretty sure you've heard, you know, these and other similar statements, or maybe you've even made them yourself. But are you sure that understanding has the backing of the Holy Scriptures? And have you personally examined the evidence to see if that's what the Holy Scriptures has to say? Indeed, this topic takes research. Have you diligently and sincerely looked into the New Testament record to see what the early assembly, the congregation of the church did after the Savior's resurrection? Have you read the prophecies concerning the new covenant and the Feast of Jah? Prophecies identifying who the new covenant is made with and what's new about it. Prophecies which tell of the coming millennium or the 1,000 year reign of peace on earth by our Messiah when all the nations of the earth will obediently keep the Most High's feasts. Have you considered those weighty scriptures which tell of the Sabbaths and holy times of Jah being observed for all eternity on the new earth? Remember, Jah is holy and so are his festivals. That's right. Or are you believing what you wanna believe because you know, you're secretly afraid of the truth, incorrectly supposing it will somehow ruin and stifle your lifestyle if you accept it. You know, you'll feel out of whack with those who are keeping Christmas, Easter, and all of those paganistic holidays. I want you to always bear in mind, facts and truths don't cease to exist because people refuse to accept them. Facts and truth are stubborn things, and the only effective way to deal with them is to scripturally examine them and then act upon them. Now, in view of this, I would advise before you make any lasting judgment one way or the other, before you settle your mind in a fixed position, which you may well find impossible to abandon, examine what the scriptures have to say about the new covenant and the feasts and holy days of the Most High underneath it. 
I want you to bear this in mind. The scriptural feasts are called the Feast of Jah, the Feast of the Lord, the Feast of Yah, the Feast of El. They belong to him. The feasts of the religious world are not his feasts. Christmas, Easter, etc., along with the lunar month, equinox, and solstice-based festivals, all of those are paganistic. <clears throat> and the Most High has his true scriptural calendar, of which you keep his true set scriptural feasts. And these are indeed very important in these end times. In Leviticus 23, Jah Almighty proclaims these holy feasts as the Feast of Jah and my feasts. Scripture. Verse 2. Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them concerning the feasts of Jah, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations. Even these are my feasts. They're not just Israelite feasts. They belong to the Most High Jah, ordained before the foundation of the world. That's right. These are the feasts of Jah, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. These are the feasts of Jah, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire unto Jah, a burnt offering, and a meat offering, a sacrifice, and drink offerings, everything upon his day. So we see here again, these are the feasts of Jah, the Lord, Yah, El, and these are holy convocations. And holy convocations mean that you are called out, you are summoned to come and meet with the Most High Jah at his appointed times. So again, these things are holy because Jah is holy. And Moses declared unto the children of Jezreel the feasts of Jah. So again, there should be without a doubt that these feasts belong to the Most High. And let that kind of be a standard in your mind. People are trying to say today that, hey, you know what? Those feasts in the Holy Bible, the scriptures there, they're done away with. But these pagan feasts that are not in the Bible, oh, yeah, you can keep those ones and do whatever you want. He knows your heart. Don't even keep the Sabbath day. It doesn't matter which day it is. He knows your heart. He knows you love him. But there could be nothing further from the truth at all. That's it's a right. very dan dangerous mindset to find yourself in. And I pray that this lesson will help all those out there who may be on the fence of wondering, how do we keep these feasts? And for sure, I can tell you and assure you this, you've came to the right place for the true scriptural calendar to set yourself with the right appointments to meet with the Most High Jah and his son, Jehoshua, and all the holy angels. Mm. Now, there are seven holy convocations or holy days that are annual festivals of the Most High. And I want to remind you that these spring feasts represent his first coming and the fall feasts represent his second coming. This is why these festivals are prophetic. If we don't understand the mysteries and the deep understanding of these festivals, we might be just losing our time, you know, our, our sense of time and not even notice the signs of the times that are coming upon us. So bear in mind again, the spring feasts represent his first coming, the fall feasts represent the second coming in the near future. And these festivals can be found in Leviticus chapter 23, and I will list them here for you. The first day of Passover, we have the seventh day of Passover, and we have the day of Pentecost, our first fruits. And within these festivals here, the day of Passover, the first day, represents the Messiah's sacrifice, his crucifixion. And the seventh day of Passover, also connected to the waving of the sheaf, represents his resurrection and his ascension to the Most High Father to be accepted and to be waved before him and to pave the way and be the forerunner for the people of Israel and the strangers who join and cleave to Israel and love the Messiah. And the day of Pentecost represents many things, the giving of the law. It represents the birth of the Messiah. He was born that night, as well as the great grand, you know, revival of Israel underneath the 12 apostles and the feast of Pentecost when they received the Holy Spirit. Now the fall feast, as I said, represent the second coming. So the fourth feast in sequence is the day of trumpets, which is the first day of the seventh month. And this first day of the seventh month is the only month that begins on the seventh day Sabbath. It's very important. We have the day of atonement as well, which is also known as the annual fast. We have the first day of tabernacles, which is a seven day feast. And then we have the eighth day of tabernacles, which basically 
concludes that festival, but shows a new coming kingdom. So let's look at a couple of things here. The law and the new covenant and the New Testament. We're going to look at the differences between the law, the new covenant, and the New Testament very quickly according to the Holy Scriptures. And remember, a covenant is an agreement or a promise between two parties that they will agree to this, you know, whatever that covenant might be. And when it came to Israel, it was that the Most High would be their El, their God, and lead them, and that they would obey him and keep his commandments. And then he would protect them, and he would offer them great things and blessings. That's right. Sorry there. So here's some new covenant basics for those who may want to understand this great topic. I want you to consider these four eye-opening truths about the new covenant that are mentioned in the scriptures. The first point is the new covenant isn't made with any Gentile or Christian church, however dedicated, large, or special it may be, may consider itself to be. Instead, it's made between Jah, the Holy One of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and his people, Jezreel. Israel and Judah, or known, also known as Jahuda in our teachings. That's the first scriptural truth many people must come to terms with. The new covenant, as well as the old covenant, was made with the people of Israel, and in particular, the ten tribes and the two tribes led by Judah. Mm -hmm. Second, the new covenant became necessary because Jah found fault with them. That is, with those early Jezreelites, those Israelites in the beginning, they broke his covenant. The problem wasn't with his covenant that was hard to keep or anything of that nature. It was that the people disregarded it. Because deep within their hearts, they didn't really want to obey the Almighty Jah, but secretly and openly rebelled against him time and time again. We know this story very well. When the Israelites you know, proceeded to disrespect the Most High's commandments, then we see that he would punish them for a time period. And then when they would reach out their hands and repent and return back to him, again, he would bless them again and return them back to a status of a nation. However, we know that ultimately, though, the, new, the old covenant was broken and the Messiah had to come and give us a new covenant. The third point is, in the new covenant, the law of the Almighty still abides. However, this time it's not written on stone tablets or sapphire stones, but it's on the hearts and minds of his elected children. I want you to take note that it's the same law under consideration here. The only difference is it's written in a different place. It will be programmed into our mind that we may walk in these holy laws. However, this has not fully happened yet at all, but it will be ratified in the future. Again, before it was written on stone tablets, in the New Covenant, it's written on true believers' minds. The tablets are the tables of the heart. And fourthly, once the New Covenant is ratified with the first resurrection and becomes fully operational, there will no longer be a need for teachers to teach spiritual lessons about the Most High Jah, because everyone who accepts the New Covenant in Jehoshua the Messiah will know him. See, this last fact proves that these vital aspects of the new covenant have still to be ratified. Now let's consider the texts which prove these above statements. Are you ready there, Dean? I'm ready. All right, sir. Jeremiah 31, verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith Jah, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So again, we see that there is a new covenant, and he's talking about it in the future because he says the days will come. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith Jah. So this first covenant was just like almost like how a marriage covenant is. Jah was the husband and Israel was his wife, but... Israel or Zion went out and committed adultery with other gods. And therefore, Jah temporarily divorced them. But even though Jah hates divorce, he wants back his bride. 
But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith Jah. I will put my law into, in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their king and they shall be my people. So again, we see here the covenant is with the house of Israel, the 12 tribes. And also in verse 31, we can see it's kind of a divided um, unity, unification with the 10 tribes of Israel and the two tribes of Judah and Benjamin, the two houses of Israel, but they will be united and be one stick. And again, look where the law is going to be in our minds. So right now, human beings, we can't, you know, unless God gives us the Holy Spirit on blast like the day of Pentecost, it's hard for us to keep the commandments, laws, and statutes. We have a great zeal to do them, and Jah will strengthen us. But left in our natural state, we will fall. And the reason why is because the carnal mind is enmity against the law of Jah, which is spiritual. However, though, we have great hope that the Most High is strengthening his people now and will continue to strengthen them in the future. Verse 34. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, No Jah. For they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith Jah. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Praise Jah. That's what we want, family. You know, we're sinful nature here, and we're trying to make it through this sinful place with sinful nature, with a sinful society, and all kind of attacks. But you stay strong, and even though sometimes we might fall, you get back up. And Jah says he won't remember our sins. As long as we turn back to him, and move and move with him that way. That's right. We will be forever clean. Forever. And we'll never ever be, be able to become dirty again. We'll be immortal creatures just like the Father and the Son. So we're going to have a little bit of a comparison of the Old and New Covenants. And I want you to take note to this chart here. First of all, the Old Covenant, it was made between... Jah the Father and Israel. It had physical promises of Jah's earthly protection. The Father said that he would be among them. There were signs of this covenant and tokens of this covenant and our laws and festivals and physical circumcision was attached to this covenant as well. And access to the Most High was via the priests and the temple. And repentance or forgiveness of sins was via animal sacrifices. And at that time, there was a physical temple or a sanctuary or a building that the people can go to to be reconciled to the Most High. And the Holy Spirit was available to a few, like the prophets, the faithful and obedient kings and special chosen ones of the Most High. It was them that had the Holy Spirit, but the people in general, John never gave it to them. But he wanted to, but because of our disobedience and, of course, due to his great plan of salvation, it was withheld. That's right. And when we look at the new covenant, some similarities. Again, it's made between the Father and Israel, and the Father includes it's ratified through Joshua the Son. We have spiritual promises and protection for eternal life. Mm-hmm. Instead of being among them, Jah would be in them by his spirit. Yes. That's when he said he would write his laws in our heart. His spirit would indwell within us. That's right. And the signs are the Holy Spirit. The same laws that are put inside us, the same festivals are there, the Ten Commandments and spiritual circumcision, because circumcision is that of the mind of the heart and not in the flesh. And remember, the Most High says in Romans somewhere through the Apostle Shaul that he who is a true Jew is one inwardly. So we profit nothing by the flesh, although Jah chose his people, but he didn't choose his people because they were black. The Hamites were black, the Canaanites were black, Egyptians were black. Many of the early nations were all black. It wasn't because of skin color, but because he wanted a particular people. And he even said that they were a small people compared to all the nations, but he would make them great. True. And also now repentance. We have, sorry, we have access to number five. We have access to the Father via the Messiah, our King, Jehoshua, Melchizedek of the Melchizedek or the Melchizedek priesthood. No more is there a a physical temple, but our bodies are the temple of Jah, so the Holy Spirit can dwell in us. And number eight there, the Holy Spirit is going to be available to all faithful and obedient human beings via the Messiah and our faith in him and walking in obedience to his love. That's right. 
So here again on the screen, you have, you have a good comparison of the Old Covenant and New Covenant. There's a comparison of the differences and also the similarities. Let's take a look in here. Shabbat Shalom from Jaron. Uh, Kiara says, Shabbat Shalom, Mishpaka family. All right, Shabbat Shalom to all. Scripture. Hebrews 8, verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith Jah, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, a lot of people will teach and say, hey, look at that. He found fault with them. It wasn't his laws, commandments, and statutes. No. You know, that he had problems. It was with the people, right? That's right. His laws, commandments, and statutes are holy. So it was the people. But we see again in Hebrews, in the New Testament, again, this new covenant is still with Israel and with Judah. Verse 9. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith Jah. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith Jah. I will put my laws into their mind, and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a king, and they shall be to me a people. Sounds very familiar from the words of Jeremiah chapter 31. That's right. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, No, Jah. For all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. Hebrews 10, verse 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith Jah. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. That's right. So Kiara asks, is he talking about the kingdom or the tribes? Well, he's talking to the tribes about the kingdom. That's right. Well said. So this is what it says. He's talking to those tribes, the 12 tribes. And remember, you know, we teach this greatly that all other nations who leave their gods and leave their false religions and join to the Messiah and cleave to Israel, they are accepted. So it says your Holy Scriptures throughout the Holy Scriptures. Many people of Israel teach that, you know, only Israel be saved, like only those who are like actual tribes of Israel. Even though, you know, something to think about family. People, you know, boast about no, being Israel, all right, that's cool, even though I find that to be nothing to be prideful about. However, though, if you notice, like, for most of the 10 tribes that come from, well, not most of let's use Joseph for an example. Mm -hmm. Joseph was married to an Egyptian woman of whom came um, Ephraim and Manasseh, of right. which came a multitude of Israelites. So many right. Israelites are half Egyptian as well. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It just seems like, you know, it's strange. Even Jah somewhere in the scripture does call Egypt his people too. But we know that the most, the apple of Jah's eye is Israel. However, though, again, when you have a good understanding, you should know that the Most High will engraft all those who believe in the Messiah and serve and worship him in truth, keeping the laws, commandments, and statutes of love, and also exercising faith and mercy in our Savior. That's right. Well said, Sean. Yes. All right. <clears throat> However, though, many sincere but misled believers suppose that the feast days in the scriptures were on a temporary feat were a temporary feature instituted by the Almighty only up until the time of the Savior's death and resurrection. Many people teach that, you know, the Messiah nailed them to the cross, which is very, very far off. See, the prevailing arguments, and you may have heard them, are that number one. They were done away with and nailed to the cross. They are complete or fulfilled in the Messiah. You know, everything is in the Messiah, so we don't have to keep them. No Sabbath day. You know, we don't have to worry about eating unclean meats. We don't have to worry about the festivals because we're complete and fulfilled in the Messiah. Or we're not in Israel and there's no temple, so we shouldn't keep them at all. It's against his word. And you'll find many Israelites who don't want to keep the festivals because that's just not something that they're, uh, I guess, learned in that they'll say this at all, always they'll say hey well we're not in israel we're not in our land so we shouldn't keep them but the scriptures teach that we can keep these things just like the seven day sabbath anywhere and remember we don't sacrifice animals anymore so the passover lamb 
that was being sacrificed before, our Passover lamb is the Messiah. And he was sacrificed outside the city walls where we go and meet with him. So we don't have to worry about being in Israel at all. But again, the sacrifices and certain drink offerings, we don't have to do those things. We just have to keep these things holy. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. And then number four, people feel, you know, there's too many different opinions on the calendar topic. So we'll just save that issue for later. And indeed, I'll admit there are a lot of issues about calendar, but this is that time where people are waking up to calendars. So right. people are starting to seek. And this is where we come on the scene as well. We have one, you know, are a set of individuals who the Most High has revealed his calendar to, not through words, but through studying and through repentance and through a man named David Ray, who spent most of his adult life searching out these things and researching these topics from the scriptures of which we've inherited in the Zion Assembly of John Jehoshua. That's right. <clears throat> and so some people feel, you know, so they're therefore of little importance to honoring the Most High under the New Covenant in the Messiah. Again, people figure, hey, you're in the Messiah. You don't have to keep these things anymore. Those are some hard laws, you know, that way. But, I mean, I don't think anything could be further from the truth that way. Yeah. Speaking about um, that last point, um, point number four, is that you know this is what it comes down to um you know many people are waking up and realizing that these feasts and holy days are indeed to be kept but the issue is how do we know when when these days are supposed to be kept on you know we recognize that there's a calendar to be followed but when is the first day when is the the 14th day of a bib when does a bib begin and so this is this is the issue that's at hand here and this is why I, there's many debates about which calendar to follow. And we give thanks to Jah that Jah has revealed his true calendar, scriptural calendar that we can prove through the scriptures. And now we can keep these holy days at the correct times. That's right, Dave. That's right. Exodus 12, verse 14. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to Jah throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. So we see this is a perpetual covenant. You see, according to Strong's, the word forever, H5769, olam, and it means everlasting, perpetual, evermore, always, continuous, unending, unending future, or for eternity. In other words, just feasts were appointed by him to be celebrated from generation to generation, age after age, for all time, throughout the ceaseless ages and time of eternity forevermore. So these festivals will be kept in the 1,000 year kingdom and will also be kept in the new heavens and the new uh, new earth that way as well. That's right. So let's look at honoring the laws and feasts of the Almighty and how they are signs of our relationship with him. A lot of people don't know that there's specific tokens and signs that the Most High gives to kind of reassure us that, you know what, we are worshiping the true Most High. Or, you better said, we know who we are transgressing against, if you know what I mean, D. Because mm -hmm. I mean, we know who we're you know, worshiping, but also we have to understand who we're transgressing so that we know how to repent and turn back to Him and what these transgressions actually are. As we know, they're breaking up his commandments of love. That's right. So Jah's laws and commands are a sign between us and Jah. And this sign is something that connects. It's like almost like a last name, you know, that connects something, you know, to another family. Or sometimes, you know, a family might have a certain kind of thing that keeps them together. Uh, it could be something physical that way. Well, the Most High as well, he has spiritual signs for us, and it's his commandments, statutes, and laws, and in particular, his Sabbath and festivals. That's right. Let's read. Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. And thou shalt love Jah thy El, with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. So again, we see here the great commandment. This is the greatest commandment that there is, right? The Messiah even said it. It's the great commandment. To love Jah with all our heart, our mind, our life, our body, with all our might. And when we do these things, we'll be keeping those first four commandments impunitively, right? Which is with the Sabbath day and how we should carry ourselves and what we should eat 
and other various understandings of we how we handle our worship. And that worship is with a capital W. We're serving him, doing the things that please him. Verse 7, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. That's right. So family out there, don't be afraid to teach your children these commandments, laws, and statutes. Indeed, they may go off when, as they get older and do their thing. But the Most High gives us a certain promise that if they do go off and they keep these words in their heart, that when they get into further into life, they will return back to the Most High. But nonetheless, you see here, we have to have the commandments, laws, and statutes, something that it's not like we walk around saying, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not do this. We walk around talking about the... We're not walk around, but we're with our children. We're talking about the beauty of Jah, the things, his holiness, because his law is summed up in the first five books. And the law is the law is not just a bunch of thou shalt's and thou shalt or anything of that. It teaches us about who the Most High is, what he likes, what he loves, what he requires from us, and his great, great power. So trust me, family, you could do great things by teaching your children these commandments. Continue indeed. Verse 8. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Ezekiel 20, verse 12. Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the job that sanctified them. And hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that ye may know that I am Jah, your Elohim. So again, we see, look at here. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, the laws and commandments are a sign. When it says a sign upon thine hand, it's a spiritual sign. It's not like these modern Ashkenazi Gentile guys out here who tie things around their arm and tie front necks and phylacteries on their head to try to make these things as between your eyes. The hand is, is in, in Scripture, especially your right hand, is symbolic of your actions, your strength, the things that you do. And the front that's between your eyes, between my eyes is my forehead. Behind my forehead is my brain. That's so God right. is saying, make these things be a spiritual sign in your actions and in your mind. And that's why, remember, the Most High said about his new covenant, he will put his laws in our mind. So they will be as frontlets. It's like frontlets is almost, in other ways, a band, something that you wear on your head and as a reminder of just holy statutes. That's so right. Voted, sorry, D, go ahead. I'm just going to say, when something is in your mind, your actions follow your thoughts. That's right. That's right. So he knows that the commandments are a sign, but then he says, my Sabbaths are a sign. And he knows he says, they shall be a sign. He's talking about his seven-day Sabbath and the other holy Sabbaths as well, the annual Sabbaths, not just the Sabbath that way. So again, he wants us to keep these things holy. So don't take the seven-day Sabbath, you know, lightly that way. It's something that we have to approach with a good mind, and it's there for us to be a sign between us and the Maker. Remember, that's the only commandment that kind of lets you know that you're serving the creator of the heavens and the earth. Because it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. For in six days, John made the heaven and the earth and all them that they're in. And then he rested. So he was the first Sabbath keeper from Genesis. And then he made it a law for us as well. So again, we want to be a part of his family. In his kingdom and his family, the Sabbath day is a day off and the annual Sabbaths. If anybody wants to go try to work during those times, it'll be problems. But not for people who are believers, because we wouldn't break his law. But this is how serious it is. Again, his Sabbaths are signs between him and us. Exodus 31, verse 13. Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am Jah that doth sanctify you. So we had before, they are signs, and here we have, it is a sign, just establishing this uniplural form of the Sabbath and Sabbaths that we must be observing in love. And we don't keep the Sabbath in a ritual way. We just keep it out of love, resting, doing that what is right, learning of him, you know, doing maybe some work for him. And I don't mean labor work, but that might be a day, you know, you go there, you might reaching out to certain individuals by working in the vineyard that way like the priests were allowed to work and then you know me doing the work for the most high not me only but other teachers and leaders out there in the world that is a part of work but it's not breaking the sabbath that way it's holy things to do verse 14 you shall keep the sabbath therefore 
for it is holy unto you. Every one that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to Jah. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days Jah made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Praise Jah. Praise Jah. We have to look at these scriptures and take these scriptures very seriously. And remember, when you come to the Messiah, you are a part of Israel. What was the new covenant? Who was it made with again? Israel. Oh. So don't try to say, oh, well, I'm not, you know, part of that Israel. That was only for back then Israel. And a lot of Christians will tell you that. That was only for them, the Jews or whatever. But it's the same thing it was then. It's the same thing now. We are joining Israel through the Messiah. That's right. You become part of Jah's family. Exactly. So here's a couple of scriptures that, uh, you know, have been misinterpreted to do away with the holy festivals and the holy feasts. And you may have heard a few of these. Colossians 2 verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new month or of the Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of the Messiah. That's right. So a lot of people will say, hey, look at it there. They said, don't let nobody judge you. So if they think that, you know, it's saying, don't let anybody judge you if you don't keep these things. It doesn't say that. No. It says, don't let anybody judge you in these things. So in the food, when it says meat, a lot of times it just means food. In, the, in meat or in drink, right? Or in respect of a holy day. That means uh, Paul is talking to the Colossians who are keeping these things. That's so we right. don't let nobody on the outside, you know, if they're in mainstream Christianity, if they're part of another religion, or if they fight against these things. Don't let anyone judge us that way because we as the body, the assembly of the Messiah, we're the ones who dictate these things. So unless they're in the Messiah and in the body of the Messiah, everybody else has no talk towards us. Why though? Because these festivals are a shadow of things to come. That's right. right? So we're showing these things. As you keep the seven day Sabbath, you're showing that I want to keep you know, your 1,000 year reign. When you're keeping all these festivals, you're letting John know, I want to be in your kingdom. I'm going to keep these things holy. And this is what it's about. That coming kingdom of the Messiah is coming and the festivals are shadows of these things. That's right. And the fact that we're given instructions to let no man therefore judge you goes to show you that there will be people that will judge us because we keep these things. So we have to be ready to give an answer um, when the time comes to stand up for Jah's word and let people know why we keep these things. Because the next verse just said, these are a shadow of things to come. That's right. That's right, Dee. Now, another of the most used texts to attempt to discourage Holy Day observance is found in the book of Galatians. Galatians 4, verse 8. How be it then, when ye knew not Jah, ye did service unto them, which by nature are no gods. But now, after that ye have known Jah, or rather are known of Jah, how, tur how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Ye observe days, and months, and times, and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. So when people usually talk about this verse, the, you know, they focus on, you know, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements? And then verse 10, you observe days. They're almost like saying, you observe these Sabbath days and these months and these holy times and sabbatical years and all of that. And they try to confuse you. But here, look what it says in Galatians 4, verse 8. How be then when you knew not, Jah, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods. Right. The and elements. The elements, the sun, moon, and stars, our solar and lunar, our lunisolar calendars. Again, those are no gods to dictate what is holy. The moon can't tell you what a holy a holy day is. Yet people will say the months are dictated by the moon and the festivals. And that's a bunch of not good stuff right there. <laughs> that's a bunch of lies and errors because it's not true. Now look what it says. You gave to those gods. It says, how turn you again to these weak and beggarly elements? Is Jah things weak and beggarly? Be you know, oh. like, is this Sabbath and Holy Days? They're weak? They're beggarly? Is that why he made them? No. So, 
you, they're not talking about that. What it's saying is that you've turned back to your paganism and you kept you going back and observing Christmas and and all these things and these things of the world and things of society, right? And he's trying to say here, hey, I'm afraid that you know I labored for you in vain because I taught you how to keep the right things and now you're going back to those weak and beggarly elements of paganistic uh, paganism worship that way. Nothing to do with the Most High's festivals at all, but people will try to convince you that it is. That's right. And Paul was concerned about this because um, he said, I'm afraid of you lest my labor is in vain. So after all this teaching about Jah, it disturbed him that these people would go back and turn to the, the beggarly elements once again from which they came. That's right. That's right. So don't let anybody fool you, family in these two new covenant verses to try to say, hey, these things are showing you you don't have to keep them. Colossians chapter two shows you you should be keeping them as a matter of fact, and Galatians four is not even dealing with the festivals, but with the paganistic festivals that way. That's right. Let's move on. So how do we keep the feasts in a basic way? Exodus 12 verse 16. And in the first day, there shall be a holy convocation. And in the seventh day, there shall be an holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat. That only may be done of you. So we see again, it says, no manner of work, right? Only things that you eat, only only for uh, um, cooking that on the festival. I mean, you can't have a festival without food being cooked. That's right. right. So, feast. But we have no work. And I'll get into a little bit of a small list of what we can be doing and not doing during these holy times. But one of the things you want to do is you want to be able to gather. Now, if even if you're not a part of a big group or congregation that way, and you have your family or even just one or two brethren, don't feel discouraged at all. Because a lot of people, they see these big groups and they want to join them because, you know, they want to feel a little bit a part of something, a part of a family. But man, you know, there could be a lot of deceptions. And I think people go to the groups, but they don't focus much on like the leader or the doctrine of those groups. They're just looking for some kind of it's uh, it's fellowship you know fellowship i guess like, it is. They like they like fellowship and which there's nothing wrong That's in right. itself but um you know if the truth is not being taught and if everyone's not on the same page you know people might be there for different reasons exactly i mean we see that the fellowship of these big churches in the world look at all of these things man they are everywhere they got great fellowship but it's all not in the name of of truth right it's you know so just be cool who you have around you because remember, we're a little flock. Few were saved. We're a remnant of the seed. We're not this big thing. And I saw this thing, you know, D on um, Thoughts, Camera, Action because you always, they have actually, their, their videos have provoking thoughts, not only mm -hmm. with truth, but provoking thoughts. And, you know, he's really exposing a lot about campianity and um, this Hebrewism. And it's another one called Hebrewism. Hebrewism. Is actually a word that means full of pride and full of nationality and all of these things. And, you know, he's just going on saying that a lot of people, too, are just joining camps, joining camps. And they're thinking that this is a we have to build up a nation. And he used the word nation and he was focusing on and he said that this is like a like one of those Jim Crow tricks. So mm -hmm. you have the nation of Islam. You have the Israelite nation. You have all these different kind of groups that are amongst black people, but they're all using that word nation. And it's a part of like national pride worship. And, you know, we can't worship a nation. We worship the most high in truth. That's right. But it was thought provoking. And um, here's a couple of verses here. Matthew 18, verse 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Do you believe those scriptures, family? I hope you do. Because the Messiah said this, and as long as it's in his name, and it doesn't mean that we all use that same name, it means his love, his authority for all that his name stands for. He says he's there. His spirit will be there. That's all we need. That's right? all we need. You have congregations full of people, but if there's no spirit, <laughs> no spirit. You can have maybe a small group and they would have the spirit. So again, I'm not putting down big camps or anything of that nature because it's good that our people are opening up their eyes to Jah's commandments, laws, and statutes. And I hope that's what it is about, not just that they're recognizing that they're Israel, which is a good thing too. But once you know that, you got to move on because our ancestors back in the day, 
They weren't arguing about who Israel was. They knew who they were, and they were very disobedient and killed the prophets and our Messiah. So I always want to make sure that we always are grounded because what has happened is over time, these that, you know, the adversary has caused us to look at skin color greatly. You know, believe it or not, America is responsible for enough racism. <laughs> and, I, and I think, yeah. you know, you said it yourself last week, I think. Esau didn't hate Jacob because of skin color. And they That's were twin right. brothers. He hated him because he took his blessings. It was a spiritual thing. And once we get a hold of that, it's better. But in America, this race card has played up big. And therefore, it's, it's spawned lots of people to fight against whitey, so to speak, and yeah. the, you know the machine. And then they don't want to let nobody in the kingdom. Like, they're so vexed, right? But... You know, we can't we can't look at it that way. We have to look at it through the Messiah's lens and through a scriptural understanding. Otherwise, we'll be led astray. That's right. And you know, when it comes to large groups, you know, um, people people are impressed and influenced um, by large numbers of people, and they get um, deceived into thinking that you know, because a, a group has a lot of people, that that's the place to be. Not focusing on the quality of the people, you know. Uh, we, we, should, we need to be content with the quality of people, not the number of people. And if they're all gathered in together in Jah's name, then we need to be content that Jah's spirit is there. Because who cares if you got a thousand people in your group? If Jah's spirit is not amongst you, you're you're not the place to be. You know. Okay. Meanwhile, the camp might have two or three small number of people. If they have Jah's spirit, that's the place you want to be at. Mm -hmm. I mean, broad is the way to destruction, right? You know, That's right. It's, it's a narrow path. So, I mean, I don't want to stay harp on that, but it's something that I think we have to open up our understanding for our people. Look for truth. And I mean, some people say, well, as long as there's a little bit of truth, and then the argument comes in, well, not everybody has all truth. Well, you better be looking for as much truth as you can because somebody can mix truth with poison, and then that truth that you think is good because they teach you that you're Israel, next thing you know, they're teaching you to hate, they're teaching you to break the Messiah's commandments when he says to love and went to turn the other cheek and you, you end up disrespecting messiah nonetheless let's let's move on with this how to keep the feast in a basic sense you keep it holy by not working or doing your own worldly pleasure no tv movies entertainment secular music sports socializing on the internet going out with friends what you can do is have a feast with believers and family have a holy convocation before Jah, same time. Rejoice, read, and remember, and repent. Give thanks and pray for forgiveness, endurance, for strength, and love for the assembly. And then you can meditate and reason about Jah's kingdom. These are all good things to do. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised, you know, with the internet, it has caused many people to end up breaking the Sabbath because they end up going in their phone and socializing and then they get caught up and they're looking at things that they shouldn't even be looking at on the Sabbath at all. But because of the pull of the internet and the addiction, I mean, the addictions now are not just like physical addictions. It's this, the internet is an addiction thing, man. It's, yeah, it is. I, I mean, can feel it, you can feel it. Go ahead. Um, probably keeping Jah's laws and his commandments are probably more challenging now than they ever were before, yeah. just due to the fact that technology has made it so easy to carry your mind away into mm -hmm. things that are not of Jah, and you know, in many instances, can be sinful as well. And um, because the access of our cell phones and things are so easy, um, you know. To, it's you're tempted a lot more easier now to break Jah's law, especially in particular polluting Jah's Sabbath days. That's right. I mean, it's not your time. That's not the time to organize your phone and go through all the old pictures that you have and go through other people's social media and see what's going on there. I mean, you limit it down to like, who are you going to check? You know, if I'm going to check a, a brother's status, it's going to be a brother. I have other people in my phone. Like I only have WhatsApp. Well, I have Instagram, but I never, ever use it. I'm still not good at it. But what I'm saying is that I don't focus on none of the heathen things. If it's a brother or sister, I'll look to what they have to say, and that's it. Otherwise, give the phone. A, it's a good time to give the phone a rest, you know, unless you're using it again for this type of communication. It's a mental thing, says uh, Carice. That's right. It's all yes. about it's all about distracting your mind. Even though you're not working, family, but if your mind is in the world, uh, you're just thinking about what's going to happen after the Sabbath or. 
I don't know what it ever it is, whatever it can be, you know, the devil is not going to let it happen. So I'm telling you, be careful with your phone. You might find that you are polluting the Sabbath. You're keeping it, but you're defiling it. If you know what I mean. That's right. It's uh, as Chris said, you know, it's mental. Where is your mind at during the, during Jah's holy time? You know? That's right. You could be lying down in your bed thinking about evil things. That's polluting the Sabbath day. That's right, D. That's right. So I want to look at something here, spiritual festival revivals and how Jah revives his people through his holy days. And what I want to emphasize here to get through this is family. Listen to me. Listen to this message and when we read it. It seems like when the Most High revives his people, like he, he pours out his spirit to call them back to him and they repent, it is always according to the holy days. Always. Not no arbitrary thing. You'll be surprised when you read the scriptures. There are specific dates for many things that happen because Jah does things according to his plan. And I do believe, again, in these last times here, Jah's Almanac, the scriptural calendar that we profess, along with the holy days. And I do believe that those who are keeping the lunisol, lunisolar kind of um, holidays, so to speak, it's just like, it's just a stage. And hopefully they can get to that and they learn about the festivals, but now they can apply it on the true times. And Again, Jah's calendar is Amnath, the scriptural calendar that, that we profess, cannot be gainsaid. Um, I know, but we know about all the other calendars, no matter what it comes down with. We've studied them. They're, they fall short. They're astronomical. And you're in the right spot to learn. But you have to be patient to learn. And if it doesn't interest you, then it's just going to fly over your head. But this is some crucial times. So you know what? Let's just get into this. Let me look in here for a second. I yeah. think um, Vanessa had a comment. Yeah, Hubris. They idolize their leaders. That's it. From Hebrews to Hubris. Or he Hubris. Yes. So a lot of a lot of that is, like, and it's full of, it means, you know, it's defined, that word Hubris is defined as full of pride. And listen, they love the white Gentiles, all of them, they love that when we go on with black pride and we want to do everything black and black home business and black that and black and black and black and black. And black, and black. They love that. They love that because it takes people away from the most high and makes them focus on their carnality. So be careful. <laughs> be very, very careful, family. Thank you uh, there, Janessa. Nice one. <clears throat> Let's continue. <clears throat> Now, as we know, the Most High brought his people out of bondage in Egypt. But what most people overlook is that it was for a specific purpose. And as it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. Jah brought his children out of Egypt so that they could keep a feast unto him. That's what the scriptures say. Mm -hmm. It was the first great revival of Israel as a nation. Take note to these things. Exodus 5, verse 1. And afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus said Jah Almighty, of Jazreel, let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. Wow. So we see again right here, look at that. Very clear. Let my people go what? That they may hold a feast unto me. So people want to say the feasts are done away with. Look what's going on here. Let's continue. Wow. I mean, that, that's interesting because Moses is telling Pharaoh, let my people go. And this is the reason why. Yeah, keep a feast unto Jah. Yeah, it, it's it's very deep and you know, I think it'd be some other type of reason, but that's the reason he put forth to Pharaoh. That's what it was. That's what it says there. Continue. And Moses said, "We will go with our young and with our old, with our sons and with our daughters, with our flocks and with our herds. We will will we go? But we must hold a feast unto Jah. We what? We must hold a feast unto Jah. Must. So he, he he made it like an urgent thing. That's right. So this is a deep truth. Jah will feast with his children in his kingdom. Pay attention to these things. As it was in the beginning, D. Social at the end. That's right. Now in the following verses, you will see that the elders of Jazreel feasted in Jah's presence in the third month. Exodus 24, verse 9. Then went up Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the Holy One of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. 
and upon the nobles of the children of Jazreel, he laid not his hand. Also, they saw Jah and did eat and drink. Well, they did wow. eat and drink? Well, that's a festival to me. Certainly sounds like it. That's what we have two things. You have food, you have drink, and then you have the great, the greatest thing, the presence of Jah. That's right. And Jah said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone and a law and commandments which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. All right. Isaiah 25, verse 6. And in this mountain shall Jah host make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the lees well refined. Wow, this is for the future. Look at that. Jah wow. talking about a beautiful feast, right? Now, don't get me wrong. The kingdom of Jah is not about eating and drinking. These things are celebrating just us being in the presence of the Most High, enjoying ourselves with Him. It's well, not so just why the food tastes nice. It's, just, it's a banquet that we're going to be with the Most High. Zechariah 14, verse 16. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, Jav Hos, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Now I want to remind everyone that this is during the 1,000 year reign on earth with the Messiah. That's right, which occurs after the first resurrection. That's right, which is, you know, 207 or so years away. Mm -hmm. Very near. Verse 17, And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, Jehovah, even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, that have no, that have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith Jah will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Wow. Because the Feast of Tabernacles, remember, represents, again, the second coming of the Messiah as well, right? And the thousand-year reign. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Wow. <clears throat> this is a prophecy about the future. Even that was back then, that was the past, but the future even that's ahead of us. That when the Messiah comes and rules all things, everybody better start keeping his stuff. That's so right. I, I would encourage anybody to learn about these festivals now. Read Leviticus chapter 23. Don't get caught up about the carnal things. Oh, do I have to build a tabernacle? Look at the holy convocation part of it. Understand the meanings behind these things. Research these things. And I can tell you there's a library on this channel that everything you need to know about the festivals is here and the almanac on this channel. It just takes time. People want to see it in a short video. But these are lessons that have to take time. You need charts, you need patience, and a lot of understanding in order to figure out and sift through. And I do know that there's many other people talk about calendars, especially the calendar of Enoch is um, one that people are people are moving from the lunisolar calendar to Enoch, and hopefully they can move from the Enoch calendar to the scriptural calendar, and maybe that might be the path. But may the Most High have mercy on us all. And um, one thing to mention, you know, this goes to show you that in the future, in this thousand year reign on earth, that one, I mean, Jah's feasts are going to be kept and they're going to be enforced. That's right. And also, there's going to be people on the earth that are still going to be disobedient and heathenistic towards Jah and his people. Wow, I know, eh? <laughs> Boy, yeah, that's something to Let's continue. Matthew 26, verse 29. <clears throat> but I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Believe it or not, he's talking about the Passover as well, and we'll show you that in a second. Mark 14, verse 25. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of Jah. Luke 22, verse 15. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of Jah. So we see very clearly that the Most High is going to have a time period when it's fulfilled that he's going to eat the Passover again with his people in Jah's kingdom. 
It's all about that same, you know, that great feast. So let's look at a few revivals under certain kings of Israel in the Old Testament time. We've got 30 minutes. We're going to look at the revival under King Hezekiah. And before Hezekiah came to the throne, the temple in Jerusalem had been tragically desecrated. The holy lamps had been put out and the temple doors were shut. Organized worship of Jah had been more or less suspended. And as a result, the kingdom of Judah, Jehudah, was spiritually bankrupt. But when Hezekiah came to the throne, a great change took place. On the first day of the first month in the Holy Almanac, the real New Year's Day, he ordered that the doors of the temple be opened and the filth that lay in the holy place be removed. Mm. Let's read those scriptures. Here's this record of Hezekiah's revival. Second Chronicles 29, verse 1. Hezekiah began to reign when he was five and twenty years old, and he reigned nine and twenty years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of Jah, according to all that David his father had done. He, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of Jah and repaired them. Now they began on the first day of the first month to sanctify, and on the eighth day of the month came they to the porch of Jah. So they sanctified the house of Jah in eight days, and in the sixteenth day of the first month they made an end. So everything took, they had eight days before they came to the porch, then there was another eight days, which gave us sixteen days total. But we can see in verse 17, the first day of the first month, this is when Jah's temple began to be repaired. Right. It's like a new year thing, right? When you cleanse your body, you know, and prepare in the new year. Continue. Chronicles 30, verse 1. And Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah, and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh, that they should come to the house of Jah at Jerusalem to keep the Passover unto Jah El of Israel. So he's requesting that the people come to keep Jah's feast. For the king had taken counsel and his princes and all the congregation in Jerusalem to keep the Passover in the second month. For they could not keep it at that time because the priests had not sanctified themselves sufficiently. Neither had the people gathered themselves together to Jerusalem. So they established a decree to make pro proclamation throughout all Israel, from Beersheba even to Dan, that they should come to keep the Passover unto the Holy One of Israel at Jerusalem. For they had not done it of a long time in such in such short in such sort as it is written. So the post went with the letters from the king and his princes throughout all Jezreel and Jehuda, and according to the commandment of the king, saying, Ye children of Israel, turn again unto Jah El of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and he will return to the remnant of you that are escaped out of the hand of the kings of Assyria. So bear in mind, this gathering was in the second month because you can keep the Passover in the second month because they couldn't keep it initially. But again, look at how he's uniting them. He's uniting them with the festival of Jah. That's right. And be not like your fathers and like your brethren which transgressed against Jah El of their fathers, who therefore gave them up to desolation as ye see. Now be ye not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto Jadael, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. Well, that's what we need right now, right? Oh, yes. We want Jah's wrath to turn away from us. For if ye turn unto Jah, your brethren and your <laughs> children shall find compassion before them that led them captive, so that they shall come again into this land. For Jah your Holy One is gracious and merciful, and will not turn away his face from you, if ye return unto him. So the post passed from city to city throughout the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, even unto Zebulon. But they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. Wow, A.D.? Shameful. Shameful. You see that? Jazz, they're being invited to Jazz festival, and they're neglecting it. They're laughing it, and they're mocking it. Even so today, people may think, boy, you know, I'm, I'm fulfilled in Christ, and may, may, may the Messiah have mercy on all who don't know certain things. But again, to scorn and laugh at Jah's holy times when you're being called to it is not a good thing. And it's interesting to note in verse 9 when it says, And if ye turn unto Jah, your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that led them captive. 
Mm. So it's like saying, it's like when you turn unto Jah, it's almost like you're the people who oppress you all of a sudden will have like compassion upon you through through Jah's mercy and will. That's right. That's but people right. want to try and fight against the oppression as if you have the power to to overcome them. Meanwhile, Jah is doing this to you. That's right. That's right. Well said, D. Continue. Verse 11. Nevertheless, diverse of Asher and Manasseh and of Zebulon humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. Also in Judah, the hand of Jah was to give them one heart to do the commandment of the king and of the princes by the word of Jah. And there assembled at Jerusalem much people to keep the feast of unleavened bread in the second month, a very great congregation. Wow, so you see again, this revival is a, re a revival to return back to Jah. And again, it's occurring during this second Passover, right? Mm -hmm. Passover can be kept in the second month if some people weren't able to keep it in the first month due to uncleanness by a dead body, sickness, or because being on a journey too far away. Numbers 9, verse 9. And Jah spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Jazreel, saying, If any man of you or of your posterity shall be unclean by reason of a dead body, or be in a journey afar off, yet he shall keep the Passover unto Jah. Mm. The fourteenth day of the second month, at even they shall keep it, and eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall, not, they shall leave none of it unto the morning, nor break any bone of it, according to all the ordinances of the Passover. They shall keep it. That's right. So again, even this holy time, this holy uh, gathering of one heart occurred during the Passover in the second month. Mm -hmm. You see, the spirit of Jah was present at that holy season, the Passover, and there followed a great outpouring of blessing on the assembled worshipers. A revival shook the city of Jerusalem and it sent spiritual vibrations to the furthermost corners of, of the Israelite nation, Jazrael. The nation once again began to obey Jah's law and to remember his holy feasts. For his part, the Almighty, in his great mercy, pardoned their sins and blessed them abundantly. And when did that extraordinary revival begin? It began, as pointed out, at the holy season called the Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread during the second month. Hezekiah began repairing in the first month, and it was by the second month they were sanctified. Bear that little known fact in mind, because again, it has deep spiritual significance True indeed. let's look at the revival under king josiah or also known as josiah after hezekiah died the nation of judah under their next king which was manasseh soon slipped back into the ways of heathenism second chronicles 33 verse 1 manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign and he reigned 50 and 5 years in jerusalem but did that which was evil in the sight of Jah, like unto the abominations of the heathen, whom Jah had cast out before the children of Israel. For he built again the high places which Hezekiah his father had broken down, and he reared up altars for Balaam, made groves, and worshipped all the hosts of heaven, and served them. Back to the lunar calendars again and solar calendars. That's right. Also he built altars in the house of Jah, whereof Jah had said, In Jerusalem shall my name be forever. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of Jah. And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Also he observed times and used enchantments and used witchcraft and dealt with a familiar spirit and with wizards. He wrought much evil in the sight of Jah to provoke him to anger. Mm. Wow. See, these are the times that he observed. Those times that he observed are the hedonistic, paganistic times of the sun and the moon and the stars right not just time you can see because it's talking it's connecting with the host of heaven so baal worship and asherah worship is dealing with worshiping the sun and moon and this is where our solar and present solar loony solar and lunar calendars come from that's right so let's see josiah's revival how he cleans up menaces evil second kings 23 verse 4 and the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priests, and the priests of the second order, and the keepers of the door, to bring forth out of the temple of Jah all the vessels that were made for Baal, and for the grove, and for all the hosts of heaven. And he burned them without Jerusalem, 
in the fields of Kidron and carried the ashes of them unto Bethel. And he put down the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places in the cities of Judah and in the places round about Jerusalem. Them also that burned incense unto Baal, to the sun and to the moon and to the planets and to all the host of heaven. Wow. wow. So when do you think these things occurred, D? During their solar and lunar times, right? That's right. I mean, it, it's very plain once you start reading scripture that the solar and lunar solar calendars are Baal calendars. That's right. And they have their own heathenistic feasts and holidays that they that they um, keep in, in, in worship of the sun, moon, and stars. That's I right. don't care what name you want to call them, Christmas, all these different names, but that's what it's for. That's right. Verse 15. Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel and the high place which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, had made, both that altar and the high place he brake down and burned the high place and stamped it small to powder and burned the grove. Wow, King Josiah wow. really took over here. And again, you see Jeroboam there, again, connected with the falsehood of calendars mm -hmm. and idolatrous feasts. And remember, he was the one who changed the Jazz scriptural almanac to the lunisolar calendar one, which was the Egyptian calendar. You see, the spiritual repercussions of these blatant sins came with frightening severity. In verse 11, we read, it says, Whereupon Jah brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. Tremendous confusion broke out in Judah, and when Manasseh died, his 24-year-old son ascended the throne, but he was murdered in the, place, in, in the palace after reigning only two years. It was the same old story. Sin degrades the, the Israelite nation, and punishment always follows disobedience. Then onto the, stage, onto the stage of time came Josiah, one of Jehudah's greatest kings. Josiah was only eight years old when he came to the throne. But he accomplished more for the truth of Jah by the age of 25 than all the kings of Israel and Judah before him. Wow. Let's read of this. Hold on there. This reformation under Josiah was swift and astonishing in its effect. With terrifying ruthfulness, he demolished the altars of Baal. He cut down the ashtarim in the high palaces. He literally purged the land of paganism and humbly reinstated the worship of Jah in accordance with his law. Remember, if you want to get more, read get, read Second Chronicles chapter 34. I don't want to cover that now. King Josiah then organized a Passover celebration and invited the whole nation to Jerusalem. Second Chronicles 35, verse 17. And the children of Israel that were present kept the Passover at that time and the Feast of Unleavened Bread seven days. And there was no Passover like to that kept in Israel from the days of Samuel the prophet Neither did all the kings of Israel keep such a Passover as Josiah kept, and the priests and the Levites and all Judah and Israel that were present and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So once more, a revival swept the nation, and Jah blessed Josiah with a blessing that will clothe him with honor and glory throughout the endless cycles of eternity. Again, when did that nation-wide revival begin? It began at the holy season of the Passover in the month of Abib, Bear that little known fact in mind, because its significance, again, will be explained later in this lesson. And this Abib is the true Abib equivalent to February, not March equinox or April. Then we have the revival under Ezra and Nehemiah, or Nehemiah. Now, after Josiah's death, the nation again sank into grievous sin. It seemed as though a devilish addiction for disobedience had gripped the people. They simply refused to obey Jah and continued to follow the practices of the heathen round about them. As for the Almighty's holy Sabbaths, they totally forsook them. The lessons of the past were all forgotten and the warning of Jah's prophets were treated with blasphemous contempt. Second Chronicles 36 verse 14. Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of Jah, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. And Jael of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of Jah, and despised his words, and misused his prophets, 
until the wrath of Jah rose against his people till there was no remedy. So we see again here, you know, Jah having a problem with his Israelite people, right? Mocking the messengers, despising Jah's words, misusing the prophets. These things weren't great or good at all. No. Verse 17. Therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees, who slew their young men with a sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion upon young man or maiden, old man or him that stooped for age. Wow. He gave them all into his hand. And all the vessels of the house of Jah, great and small, and the treasures of the house of Jah, and the treasures of the king and of his princes, all these he brought to Babylon. And they burnt the house of Jah, and break down the wall of Jerusalem, and burn all the palaces thereof with fire, and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. And them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to, to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of Jah by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. 70 wow. years. 70 years, that's right. So you see, look at all of this was going on because the people them weren't keeping up the Sabbath. They weren't keeping the sabbatical years. They weren't keeping the Sabbath. They weren't keeping the festivals. And the land, Jah said, needed rest. So all of this came because they ignored Jah's holy times. And of course, when you ignore Jah's holy times, that's not the only thing they did. They ended up worshiping on pagan times. Right. The prophet Jeremiah lived during this period of rebellion and his book of Lamentations is perhaps the saddest book in the scriptures. What did Jeremiah say about Jah's feast? This is what he said. Lamentations 1 verse 4. The ways of Zion do mourn because none come to, none come to the solemn feasts. Wow. All her gates are desolate. Her priests sigh. Her virgins are afflicted and she is in bitterness. Her adversaries are the chief. Her enemies prosper. For Jah hath afflicted her for the multitude of her transgressions. Again, if you want to get more information on that, you can read the rest of Lamentations chapter 1, and you see the verses on your screen. So the tragically misunderstood prophet Jeremiah could not imagine anything more distressing than his country's destruction. Her capital city burned to the ground, and her beautiful temple reduced to a pile of rubble. Yet, he knew within his bones that a mocking disregard for Jah's law and especially his feast was the forerunner of national catastrophe. Remember, they mocked, again, this invitation. Jeremiah could see, and that very plainly, that Jah's law, the irrevocable constitution of this mighty universe, was being contemptuously set aside by the masses, who were being deluded by their blind and stubborn religious leaders. Just like how Gino Jennings leads everybody away from the Sabbath and the dietary law. And many Christian teachers do the same thing. And much less even talk about the festivals to those guys. But yeah. this is what they do. They lead the people away, make them eat unclean meats, make them to defile Jah's Sabbath and all of that. It, it's, it's wicked, you know. And then people love these men that just because they're black and that whole Hebrews thing, you know what I mean? That whatever, follow what the leader does. And why? That whole church has his spirit. <laughs> that's, that's true. It's very true. The nation of Israel rejected Jeremiah's call to repentance, and in the course of time, the inevitable happened. The Holy One of Jezreel allowed the city of Jerusalem to be conquered by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. His well-disciplined but ruthless battalion stormed the capital and literally tore it apart. Thousands of terrified half-naked captives were brutally deported to Babylon, and the land of Judah was subdued and lay desolate for 70 years. Time passed, the predicted 70-year captivity ended, and the returning exiles came back in waves to the Promised Land. And under Zerubbabel, the governor, Nehemiah the prophet, and Ezra the priest, the city of Jerusalem and Temple of Jah were rebuilt. There followed a revival of mighty significance, and one that caused the enemies of truth to tremble throughout the land. And with astonishing speed, the wall of Jerusalem and the Temple of Jah were rebuilt, and the holy feast days of Jah were, were proclaimed. A holy spirit of dedication swept the country, and all pagan associations and alliances were broken off. Multitude of believers attended the holy feast, and blessings of the Almighty poured down on the nation. Nehemiah 8, verse 1. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into, into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, 
which Jah had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Wow, what day is that, Dean? That's for day of trumpets. Day of trumpets that we're going to have in a couple of weeks. But look what's happening here. Again, people have to have understanding when you're reading scripture because not everyone has understanding. Otherwise, why would we need teachers, right? That's right. <clears throat> and he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday before the men and the women and those that could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. Oh, see, just spirit was now moving them, right? You're, that's what right. it is. When just spirit is in you, D, you become attentive to his book. You start right. reading the words very seriously. Right. You'll become attentive to his words, and it causes you to understand what's being spoken. That's right. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed Jah, the great Elohim, and all the people answered, So be it, so be it, with lifting up of their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped Jah with their faces to the ground. Wow. Also Jeshua and Banai and Sheribiah and Jamin, Akub and Shabbatai, Hodijah and Measijah and Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Paliah, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law. And the people stood in their place. Wow. Wow. So they read in the book of the law of Jah distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. And that's what we're supposed to do as a teacher, right? And a leader, make people understand the reading of the scriptures rather than putting, you know, your own twist on things and, you know, distorting and resting the scripture. That's right. And Nehemiah, which is the Tershatha, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto Jair El. Mourn not, nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our master. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of Jah is your strength. Wow, you see the repentant heart that these people have, right? Yes. They bawled all the people together because they knew that they fell short of just things. And again, during this holy time, he's saying, this day is holy unto our master, unto Jah, right? Mm. So the Levites stilled all the people, saying, hold your peace. For the day is holy, neither be ye grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. Wow. See what makes them joyful? Understanding Jah's words. Wow. And it kind of reminds me of like us, you know, like when we live in the world and we don't know the truth, when you come to the truth and you understand it, there's a certain feeling that you get that makes you joyful. It makes you happy. It's like, wow, like I, I understand this, you know? And yeah. I, that, that can give you an idea of how these people must have felt. Yes. <clears throat> and on the second day were gathered together the chief of the fathers of all the people, the priests and the Levites, unto Ezra the scribe, even to understand the words of the law. And they found written in the law, which Jah had commanded by Moses, that the children of Israel should dwell in booths in the feast of the seventh month. So again, look at this revival, David. It's in the seventh month, on the first day of trumpets, and then the, even the emphasis on the, day, the feast of tabernacles. And remember, the seventh month is coming up in two Sabbaths. That's right, two weeks. So again, we have another revival, right? And that they should publish and proclaim in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go forth unto the mount and fetch olive branches and pine branches and myrtle branches and palm branches and branches of thick trees to make booths, as it is written. So the people went forth and brought them and made themselves booths, every one upon the roof of his house, and in their courts, and in the courts of the house of Jah, and in the street of the water gate, and in the street of the gate of Ephraim. And all the congregation of them that were come again out of the captivity made booths, and sat under the booths. For since the days of Joshua the son of Nun, unto that day had not the children of Israel done so, and there was very great gladness. Also day by day, 
from the first day of the last, from the first day unto the last day, he read in the book of the law of Jah, and they kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day was a solemn assembly according unto the manner. Wow. wow. And this assembly was again the eighth day festival, and all these festivals are found in Leviticus chapter 23. But again, you can see this unification and revival under Nehemiah and Ezra was very powerful at that time. Wow. These events are recorded in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, and what thrilling read they make. Just people, after a long and painful exile, return to the land of promise and to the city that they love. The spiritual lessons for the assembly of today are too numerous to tell, though thousands of worthy sermons have been based on them. But what is not generally known is the fact that all those recorded experiences of ancient Jezreel, ancient Israel, and Judah are examples for us. The experiences I'm speaking about are the oppressive slavery in Egypt, salvation through the blood of the Passover lamb, the exodus under Moses and the giving of Jah's almanac, his calendar, and his law at Sinai, the entry into Canaan under Joshua, son of Nun, the nation's repeated backslidings and the revivals of the holy seasons, the punishments during these times of apostasy, the blessings during these times of obedience, the defeats and the dispersion because of national sin, and finally, the return to the promised land. All of these things occurred specifically under Jah's almanac according to his holy times. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. Now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So yes, believe it or not, many Bible-based groups and congregations and of course the heathenistic Christian church for all their boasted knowledge and wealth is in fact repeating those ancient experiences on the spiritual plane in this very day. And what is even more amazing is that she's doing so according to a holy appointed schedule, which parallels those rivals of long ago. In this revival under Nehemiah and Ezra, take special note of these points. The burnt offerings to Jah were resumed on the first day of the seventh month, the Feast of Trumpets. Ezra, the scribe, the scribe of the law of Jah, set out from Babylon on the first day of the new year and arrived at Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month. You can see that in Ezra 7. A work of separation from pagan alliances began on the first day of the 10th month and was completed exactly three months later by the first day of the first month. Mm. And they kept the Feast of Tabernacles as a revival to Jah. Once again, the feasts provide a revival of the people of Israel. Are these facts and times significant? I believe they are. And indeed, if you were to take a concordance and read every text in the scriptures where the word month is mentioned, your eyes will be open to this astonishing truth that Jah is working to a carefully planned schedule in which every future stage of the plan of salvation has already been prefigured by a literal event, a type, a shadow, a miniature demonstration, a spiritual blueprint which has already taken place in the history of his people at an appointed time. And those appointed times of long ago all of them are directly linked to the end time events in the Almighty's calendar. We refer to the scriptural calendar as Jah's Holy Almanac. Jah's Almanac is a yearly calendar given the days, dates, weeks, and months of the year, along with important dates of the Holy Feast. This is what we are professing. In regards to Jah giving us the dates of his important events in his chronological time frames, Jah tells us in his scripture, the exact moment when the abyss, when the flood happened, burst open in Noah's day and the top of the mountains appeared, everything is recorded by date. When the covering of the ark was removed, that's a date. The date that Moses received Jah's almanac. The date the tabernacle was erected in the wilderness. The day Moses reiterated Jah's law to Israel. All of these occurred on specific scriptural dates of which Jah's almanac can showcase these exact times. All these and numerous other events are specified, specifically referred by date, which means that believers living in the closing days of this age should closely study the details of those ancient events and their dates. Why? Because when the spiritual realities portrayed by those ancient events occur in our day, we can be certain that they will occur on the same dates in the Holy Almanac as their Old Testament counterparts did in days gone by. In other words, future events have not only been foreshadowed 
but the dates on which they will occur have also been specified. Wow. In the future, Jah will feast with us as was his intention. Even so too will Jah remove on an appointed day the covering that is draped over the minds of millions, this blanket of falsehood. Isaiah 25, verse 6. And in this mountain shall Jah host make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the leaves, of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the leaves, well refined. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. Wow, that's the falsehood, right? That's right. He will swallow up death in victory, and Jael will wipe away tears from all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth. And Jah, for Jah had spoken it. Praise Jah. Jah. Wow, what a beautiful verse. A promise of our hope, right? Let me just get the last one under the apostles. This is my last couple of slides because we can't leave out the apostles during this time here. No. No revival in the history of the earth can compare with one which began on the day of Pentecost in the year of the Messiah's resurrection. For 40 days after his resurrection, the master appeared several times to his disciples and proved that he was alive. And during those days, he talked with them about the kingdom of Jah and gave them this specific order. Acts 1 verse 4, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days hence. So here the Savior was commanding the apostles to wait for the Feast of Pentecost, to gather and stay in Jerusalem till that holy season arrived. In obedience to his command, they stayed in the city and waited and awaited the day of Pentecost and the promised gift. Acts 2 verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And remember, this house is just temple. <clears throat> That's right. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So you see this outpouring of just spirit was, and is still, and still is for that matter, accompanied by power to witness effectively. The Holy Spirit is not just for performing miracles. Remember the Messiah's words. Acts 1 verse 8. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judah and in Samaria, unto the uttermost part of the earth. So when we get this Holy Spirit of power, we will be able to preach and teach effectively for those people to increase their faith and bring understanding. But again, when did this all take place? The day of Pentecost, one of Jah's holy festivals, the Feast of First Fruits. Mm -hmm. This prophecy began to come to pass within a few days with an experience on the Feast of Pentecost that transformed the early Jesuit Nazarene assembly from a small, timid group of believers into a spiritual dynamo that lit up the whole civilized world with the glorious gospel, the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. Then for the very first time, the real significance of Jah's feast days became apparent. For here indeed was Jah's setting before his obedient assembly a spiritual banquet a holy infilling so glorious that the finest feast of literal food could only be a faint shadow. Now let no one suppose that the mighty outflow of spiritual power which came on the assembly at Pentecost some 2,000 years ago was all that the eternal Jah has planned for his people. Oh no. The prophecy of Joel chapter 2 goes far beyond the happenings on that memorable day in Jerusalem. The events recorded in Acts chapter 2 are by comparison only the appetizers the starter is the fourth taste and beginnings of a much greater banquet of power still to be set before the obedient assembly in the near future. On some coming feast day, the Almighty One of Jezreel is going to astound the universe with the next great event in his program of salvation, praise John. And we can be certain that it will be an event more spectacular, more wonderful, and more powerful, and more effective than all the children of men have hitherto seen or even remotely imagined. Mm -hmm. Now just pause a while and consider, yes, analyze the revivals that we have spoken about and recorded in scripture. 
the revival of keeping a feast to Jah and his rescuing of his children in slavery? Did you notice that they were all directly linked with the holy seasons in the Almighty's almanac? That they are all to, all either began with or climax on one or the other of the holy feast days of Jah? And I mean, why not? For that is exactly why the eternal maker of the universe ordained his feasts. The feasts are his appointed times and holy seasons and are entered in his diary as days of special significance, days to keep holy, days to look forward to, and days to remember. They are holy memorial days set apart to mark the times when he would perform his greatest acts in the field of salvation. This is why he has commanded his followers to remember them, to celebrate them with feasting, joy, and gladness, because the truth is this. They are the holy memorial days of Jah's salvation, who is none other than Jehoshua of Nazareth, the son of Jah. All praise and glory be to him. We observe the feasts because they are a shadow of the salvation of Joshua the Messiah, the son of Jah the Abba. So don't let anyone confuse you by saying that the scriptural feast days of the Almighty One of Joshua, Israel, Israel have been done away with because they haven't. All who make such wild and totally irresponsible and unscriptural claims, and you will hear them, believe you me, are insulting the wisdom and ability of the Most High to formulate his own laws. Imagine, he who knows the end from the beginning, would he have used such enduring language and terms such as forever and ever, perpetual, and from generation to generation, if all along his plan was to do away with the feast, with Joshua's sacrifice? <laughs> God forbid. The very idea borders on blasphemy and is being given this coverage because of the untold damage this false doctrine is causing in the ranks of scriptural believers put forth by false teachers and the Christian church. The plain truth is this. As the supreme judge and advocate in the law court of heaven, John knew perfectly well what he was saying when he commanded his solemn feast to be celebrated forever from age to age for all time. And I'll leave, leave you with this. All of this is living by active faith. Responding to Jah's instructions is a matter of faith, just as Paul says here. Second Corinthians 5, verse 7, For we walk by faith, not by sight. Right. If there's, if therefore, it's therefore important for us to start keeping the holy days upon his true calendar, his true almanac, when we learn about them. And even though we may not understand everything at first, we will learn a great deal more as we actually begin observing them. And believe you me, every year there's great truths always added by the Most High to strengthen our faith during, faith during these festivals. Every single year, something new and outstanding is shown in the Holy Scriptures that Jah shares with his people during these holy times. So in summary, family, Zion, Israel, Jews and Gentiles alike, the feast days of Jah are times of holiness and unity with Jah because of their meaning for us, of the wonderful hope they promise for all mankind. Observing the holy days reminds us of Jah's great love for humanity. Worshiping Jah in this way is a personal joy and pleasure. I speak from that personally. These festivals truly are Jah's gifts to his people. That's right. With that said, as always, all praise and glory to Jah our Father and Jehoshua the Nazarite who died for our sins, his holy son, that we may have eternal life. May you be strengthened to keep Jah's festivals in the future, and may Jah strengthen you to walk in his law, and may his mercy be upon Israel. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Most High. Praise Jah. Thank you for listening, family. And I pray that you've gotten some understanding and you've been strengthened in this powerful lesson dealing with Jah's festivals because we're living in these end times. So be strong, continue to fight the good fight, pray for knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, and continue to seek, and you will find. Thanks again for listening, and for those in the future who are hearing this, if you're on a way to comment, and if you have any questions, anybody listening live, you can put them in now before we close down. Yes, brother. Yes, speak up, Johnny. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Oh, thank you, Brother David. Thank you, Brother Sean. Yes, you're welcome, my man. Have a good week. Keep the faith. Stay strong.
Andrea says, give thanks, brothers, for your efforts today. May Jah continue to strengthen both of you in this journey. Hallelujah. Praise Jah. Give thanks, Andrea. Thanks. Yes, yes, Chris, give thanks. Mm -hmm. Janessa says, nice reminder to keep the feast. Yes, two weeks till the Feast of Trumpets, the yeah. first day of the seventh month. So next week, we're going to have a preparation for Ethanim of what to expect and um, how we will get into it. And then the following, we'll be having the Feast of Trumpets on that Sabbath lesson as well. Mm -hmm. Great things to look forward to. Mm. All right. Well, you know what, brother? I think that's it. All right. Hope everybody has a good week. And uh, take this as a reminder to prepare yourselves to keep John's feasts that are coming up. Mm -hmm. God strengthen all of you. And I hope the job blesses us all and give us strength to overcome. Yes, sir. Bless up. All right. Well, one love. John says one love to all. Glory to John, his only begotten son, Jehoshua, always. All right, brother man. <clears throat> Sean, bless up. Wake up, grill. Everyone have a good week. Keep the faith. Bless up. I'm out. Easy. All right. Thanks again, everyone. One love. Let's end this broadcast. <laughs>